Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, Ramiumptum Ruminations. My name is Scott, and I'm the host. Today's episode is called, What is Tithing? Thanks for coming back to listen to another episode. Before I jump into the bulk of the section, it's been a little bit since I've done a shameless self plug. So I'm going to throw that in right here. If this podcast is something that you enjoy, you want me to keep producing them, please consider becoming a monthly recurring donor to the podcast. Go to ramiumptumruminations.org and click the donate button on the side. If you go to the Mormon Discussions website and you click donate there, you can select the draw to, the drop down menu and uh, choose which podcast you'd like to donate to. So if you like what I'm doing, you want to throw me a little money, greatly appreciate it. If that's something that you're not financially able to do, I completely understand. There's no pressure. A way that you can help if, again, if this podcast is something you enjoy, you want to help, but you can't financially help me, go throw a comment in in some of the videos reach out to me share it with some friends when we comment on the youtube page or on the website it boosts visibility so it will uh, be shown to more people the last few weeks we've been discussing the vast amounts of wealth that the lds church has amassed over recent years and we've been discussing the sec allegations against the church obfuscating the amount of money that is held by the institution. I want to continue on the subject of money, but we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about tithing. The subject of tithing is fascinating. The way it's practiced today does not reflect well the way that it was practiced anciently. There's some interesting contrasting ideas there that I'd like to flesh out. So this week and maybe next week, we'll talk a little bit about tithing and how it was practiced anciently in in contrast with how it's practiced today. To introduce the subject before we go back in time and talk about what the scriptures actually say about tithing, I want to read from the gospel topics, not the gospel topics essays, but just the gospel topics on the LDS website on their page about tithing just to make sure that we're all on the same page of what the church teaches about this. Tithing, if you want to go and look it up, you just Google LDS Church tithing, and it's, I think, the second hit. Um, The first one talks about tithing and donations. At least when I Googled it, the first hit was about tithing and donations. This one is just the Gospel Topics article about tithing. It says, The Bible indicates that God's people followed the law of tithing anciently. Through modern prophets, God restored this law once again to bless his children. To fulfill this commandment, church members give one-tenth of their income to the Lord through his church. These funds are used to build up the church and further the work of the Lord throughout the world. My reason for jumping into this, one of the talking points of the LDS church is that through Joseph Smith, all things were restored to how they were anciently practiced. But I I want to demonstrate in this episode that the way tithing is practiced today is fundamentally different than the way it was instituted and practiced in ancient Israel. One of the references that the LDS church uses is Genesis 14, 17 through 20, where Abraham goes and pays tithing to Melchizedek, king of Salem. In this passage, Genesis 14, 17 through 20, it talks about uh, Abraham paying a tithe to Melchizedek. Now, in the LDS scriptures, if you click on, or if you go to the footnote B on verse 20, where it talks about tithes, it's a little misleading here, but it says it references Alma 13, 15 to give more, re- more uh, background on this. And in Alma 13, 15, it says, and it was this same Melchizedek to whom Abraham paid tithes. Yea, even our father Abraham paid tithes of one tenth part of all he possessed. 
here in Alma, the Nephites are supposed to be practicing laws of Moses that were practiced anciently in Israel. But this fundamentally misses exactly what tithing was and how it was practiced back then. As we're going to dive into some of these passages and talk about some of the some of the scholarship around this subject, it was not a tithing of what they possessed. It was an agricultural tithing, not a fiscal or monetary tithing. So let's get to some of these references. Let's try and understand exactly what the Old Testament says about tithing. And as far as I could research, there wasn't a ton that the New Testament actually says about tithing. So I'm going to, most of the passages that I I'm going to cite here uh, are, come from the Old Testament. To start examining exactly what the Old Testament does say about tithing, let's jump to Numbers 18, 20, and 21. Yahweh talking to Aaron and describing his situation as the tribe of Levi and the priests not having a share of inheritance of the land. So here's, here's what it says. The Lord said to Aaron, you will have no inheritance in their land, nor will you have any share among them. I am your share and your inheritance among the Israelites. I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. In other words, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, the priests, they do not pay tithes. They receive the tithes because they're not, they did not inherit any land. So I'm going to jump to an article on the Bart, Bart Ehrman blog that uh, summarizes this a little bit better and gives a little bit more insight. What he's discussing in this is differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time of Christ. One of the subjects that, the subjects that he hits on is how the Sadducees, pardon me, how the Pharisees saw the law of tithing. So I'll read, it's a couple paragraphs down, but if you're interested, the article is called Ancient Jewish Sects, Pharisees and Sadducees. And he says, the law of Moses commands Jewish farmers to give one-tenth of their crops, that is a tithe, to the priests and Levites. Priests perform sacrifices in the temple, and Levites were their assistants. Since they themselves were not allowed to farm, the tithes they received represented their financial support for serving God. What should a person do, however, who purchased food from a farmer, not knowing whether the food had been properly tithed? To be on the safe side, some Pharisees maintained that they should tithe the food they purchased, as well as the food they grew. This way, they could be certain that God's law was being followed. And if it got followed twice in this case, so much the better, especially for God's priests and Levites. Here's where things are going to get very tricky. I've kind of gone back and forth in my head on how much, how deep to dive on this. When we look into how tithing operated in ancient Israel for the Jews, it was in seven year cycles. And then there were some seven times seven, so like 49 year cycles. And each year there were different types of tithes paid. And there were different things that were done with those tithes. In the Jewish cal calendar, there are seven year cycles. And the seventh year of these seven year cycles is called a Shemitah year. And the Shemitah year is where the fields lie fallow. There's nothing planted and they, they basically let the land rest. Within those seven year cycles, there are two tithes that are done each year. And depending on the year, the tithing goes to different things. So typically it's sent to the priests and the Levites. But then on every third year, one of those biannual tithes is also distributed among the poor. And that's the way that it functioned in the ancient world. So to contrast that and say, as it said in Alma that I read at the beginning of the episode, that Abraham was tithed of all of his possessions doesn't seem to track with the way tithing was practiced in the ancient world. 
there's a lot of different things that happened with this, but all of it was a tithing on agricultural products. It was not a fiscal tithe. When tithing is described in the Old Testament, specifically in Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, this tithing is only referring to an agricultural tithe given to the priests and the Levites as their inheritance for their service in the temple. Leviticus 27.30 says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And again, here in this passage, it's not talking about any sort of financial obligation to pay money to the church or to pay money to the priests and the Levites. There are passages, or there is a passage that I'm aware of, and the listener out there, hey, if you know some more, please throw them my way. There's a passage where it does talk about a, f- a fiscal responsibility to the priests and the Levites. As I said at the outset, one of the ways believers have tried to explain away the vast sums of money that the church has amassed over the years is that these tithes are a way to keep the lights on and to make sure that the church has the funds that it needs in order to buy land and maintain its properties. Now, I do have complaints about that. I'm going to leave it at that for now, and we'll continue on with this discussion about tithing. I've beaten the horse dead in the last couple of episodes, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. One of the ways a believer has tried to explain away or justify the hoarding of money within the LDS church is that the, the church has to keep the lights on somehow. They have to pay for the landscaping. They have to pay for X, Y, and Z, whatever the expense is for the operation of the church. But when we look at how tithing operated in the ancient world, it had nothing to do with money. It was an agricultural tithe, not a fiscal tithe. So what about in the ancient world? How did these these priests and these Levites, how did they keep the lights on? How did they pay for repairs on the temple? Or what was this equivalent in the ancient world to the way tithing is used today? There's an interesting passage in Exodus 30. If you want the whole thing, it's kind of 11 through 16, but I'm only going to read a couple of passages within there. A little of uh, context of this, this, this passage is from when the children of Israel entering the Holy Land. So as they cross into the Holy Land, they're being counted. They're, uh, they were instructed to do a census. And part of this census is, is God required each of them to pay a donation And this donation was given to the priests and the Levites. It's kind of a cross between like a tax on the people and also a donation to the church. The way I think of it is like a temple tax. And verse 12, it says, When you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life at the time he is counted. Then no plague will come on them when you number them. Each one who crosses over to over to those already counted is to give a half shekel according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 geras. This half shekel is an offering to the Lord. All who cross over, those 20 years old or more, are to give an offering to the Lord. The rich are not to give more than half a shekel, and the poor are not to give less when you make the offering to the Lord to atone for your sins. Receive the atonement money from the Israelites and use it for the service of the tent of meeting. It will be a memorial for the Israelites before the Lord, making atonement for your lives. All this background and scripture to say that the way the LDS church presents tithing and presents it as a restoration of an ancient practice does not appear textually to match up with how it was practiced anciently. We don't have tithing cycles. We're not tithed on agriculture. It seems to be a wholly separate practice or separate definition of tithing than was understood by the ancient world and practiced by the very Jews in the scriptures that we read about when we read the Old Testament. Another passage that's cited by the LGS church to uh, promote or explain 
the commandment of tithing as they would teach it is Malachi 3, 8, and 8 through 11. It's one we've heard over the years within the LDS church. Will a man rob God? I want to point out verse 9 and 10 because I think this points specifically to what was being tithed and what was being offered to these priests. In 10, it says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And then it goes on, and prove me not herewith, yada yada. It's saying, bring me the tithes so that there's meat in the house. The tithe that's being brought is food. It is meat in this specific passage. It is not money. Next week, I'm going to talk a little bit more about money in an abstract way. On one hand, it might bridge this gap and say, you know, yeah, maybe in the past we brought food as a tithe, but now we do money. Thinking of it as an, in an abstract way will also complicate things tremendously. So that'll be the discussion next week, but I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so I'm going to turn to modern scripture, and this is Doctrine and Covenants 119, where it, according to a believer, this is God laying down the law of the tithe to the LDS people in the modern day. I think there's a gap that can be bridged here. I think this is a space for a believer to, where a believer might be able to say, look, you know, maybe a restoration isn't the right word, but it's changed and it's a different thing now. So we'll read a couple of these verses. Uh, verse one, this is again, uh, 60, uh, pardon me. I think I said 64. I meant to say 119. Doctrine and Covenants 119 and verse one, it says, verily thus saith the Lord, I require all their surplus property to be put into the hands of the bishop of my church in Zion for the building of mine house and for the laying of the foundation of Zion and for the priesthood and for the debts of the presidency. And this shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. So what it says here is it's, it's a surplus of property. And then in verse four, so that tithing, you know, verse one, one to three, the tithe is this surplus of property put into the bishop's hands. Verse four says, and after that, those who have thus been tithed shall pay one-tenth of all their interest annually, and this shall be a standing law unto them forever. For my holy priesthood, saith the Lord. It seems that, that in this passage, they're making a distinction between giving your surplus property to the church and paying your interest. Maybe it was originally intended to be understood as both of those things, like you give everything above what you need back to the church and to God, and on top of that, you also pay interest on one-tenth of all your interest annually. The disconnect that I see in the way that this is presented within the LDS church is that it doesn't seem to be practiced in any way that looks similar to the way it was done anciently. If we followed those same seven-year cycles, there should be years where we don't pay tithing or where we don't give anything to the church. And we let the land rest but instead, it's shifted over to a, a flat fee for membership. I want to harken back to that Exodus 30 passage, passage I just read where every member of the church was supposed to pay the exact same dollar value. No more, no less. How interesting would that have been? If instead of saying 10% of everything you earn or everything you make, it was just a flat fee for membership to cover the lights and perhaps provide for the pastor or the bishop. Referring to this as a simple restoration of all things is misleading because this has nothing to do with the way tithing was practiced anciently. The way tithing is practiced in the modern church is a fiscal affair, and anciently it was an agricultural one. As I said, next week I want to talk a little bit more about I want to talk about money in an abstract way to understand exactly what the church is requiring of us and maybe what some implications of that are. And I think, I think after that discussion, I'll be done with money and tithing and the SEC charges for a while <laughs> until somebody else makes a comment and it gets my mind spinning and I have to talk about it again because that's exactly what happened for this episode and the one that's coming up. So as I said at the outset, please consider becoming a monthly recurring donor to the podcast. If you can't, leave a five-star review on whatever streaming service that you're using. 
share it, leave a comment, reach out to me. I love hearing from the listeners. This has been such a pleasure to do. And I look forward to continuing doing this for you guys in the future. And also for me, I love just researching these things and having like a purpose to what I'm researching. (laughs) Anyway, wherever you find yourself out there, cleaning out sand from the backseat of your car after a recent beach trip, I hope that you have an excellent day.